Oh yeah. Oh yeah. We are live now, baby. All right. Shut this thing down here. Okay. You. You. Oh. We got here. We got. Iron sharpeneth iron, so a man sharpeneth the countenance of his friend. Iron sharpeneth iron, so a man sharpeneth the countenance of his friend. You. You're listening to the Iron Show with Johnny McMahon. We're proud to have the Iron Show right here on Fringe Radio Network. That's FringeRadioNetwork.com. Oh, man, there's like way too way too many uh, headset sounds here. Okay, let's try it again. <laughs> <laughs> that was my fault. I was, uh, uh, I was helping my daughter to the last minute on her math homework and was trying to set up as you were playing. <laughs> live, live radio, everybody. See, Matthew, this is why I don't just uh, take, take the feed and leave it because... Okay. What? I've had some good stuff, man. That's <laughs> why I edit this these. Is Johnny at his finest, baby. Matthew's, <laughs> Matthew, was ta- I was talking to Matthew last week. He's like, what? Edit? You edit them? I go, yeah. This is a production here, buddy. Okay, here. Oh, what do we got here? We got have- I am not on the Fringe Radio Network. Um, looks like producer Rick is like out of town. So... So um yeah so uh <clears throat> so I'm um, we are on Spreaker though anybody wanna anybody wanna snag that you guys wanna snag on my Facebook page there's a link there you guys could uh, grab that sna- uh, swipe it copy it paste it pimp it promote it I've been working on this song, this old avant-garde song called The Spider. I can't play it yet. But, uh, because I didn't write it. Ron Chick wrote it. But, uh, I've been working on it all week. I've played a little, see how much I can play. The Spider. Oh, oh man, it was one word. No, get on that one. Okay, let's see here. Okay, let's try it again here. I'm gonna fire it up again. Okay, I'm required to set shut down this machine. Okay, here we go. Iron sharpeneth iron, so a man sharpeneth the countenance of his friend. Iron sharpeneth iron, so a man sharpeneth the countenance of his friend. Of his friend. Of his friend. Of his friend. You're listening to the Iron Show with Johnny McMahon. We're proud to have the Iron Show right here on Fringe Radio Network. That's FringeRadioNetwork.com. Oh, yeah, baby. Oh, yeah. Whoa, let's see where you get my hair. La, 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 la. Hi, everybody. Welcome to... Oh yeah! Oh yeah, baby! And we are live, and we are in your ear. Oh yeah! All right, welcome to tonight. We have 
very special uh, session on the Iron Show tonight. Tonight we um, are uh, embarking upon our epic journey through the Book of Judges. We have uh, with us Matthew Miller. Oh, Matthew. Oh, Johnny, it is so gracious to be here. I was drinking to say what's up, but like, I had the music all ready for it. It's just waiting here. <laughs> <laughs> Boom, baby. What's up? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. And tonight we also have Rabbi Mike. Oh, Rabbi Mike, when you are captured... And they put you in a room for three weeks without any food. And you're starving to death. And they throw you under the table and cut off your thumbs and make you try to pick up pork chops <laughs> without any thumbs. Does it make you cry? Uh, because I know Joshua's gonna come kill the guy. <laughs> All right! <laughs> yeah! <laughs> All right, tonight we are doing our epic journey through the Book of Judges, part two. Uh, last last uh, time we were here, uh, which uh, I'll see you, uh, two weeks ago, I guess it was. Um, I had uh, two bone screws removed in, in the in the following days. I missed last week because I was just I was in bad shape. So uh, anyway, but uh, so we. Uh, we started the Book of Judges about two weeks ago, and it's been one of my, for some years now, it's been a um, healthy fantasy. You know, we all talk about sick fantasies, but then uh, sometimes we have healthy fantasies. And I have long wanted and had a fantasy of uh, going through the Book of Judges with Matthew Miller and Rabbi Mike. And uh, so we're here tonight. <clears throat> really, for to to get into part two of this study, last last time we uh, in part one, we really just kind of got things kicked off. I mean, we didn't go very far into it. I mean, we got pretty much as far as uh, Bezek, the uh, king that uh, got his thumb chopped off, thumbs chopped off, and thrown under the table and to beg for scraps, and and um, and Mike uh, did a little uh, presentation on the. Sons of Anak, which comes a few verses later there. And uh, and that's really about as far as we got. And then Rick White, my old co-host, called in. And we went kind of off the rails. and uh, But we really kind of pretty did pretty much did a good, pretty much good in introduction into the Book of Judges, I think. We have rails? Uh, say again? <laughs> we have rails? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> that would be something. <laughs> I'm getting producer Rick uh, communicating with me here. Yeah, I'm trying to connect via EdCast, producer Rick, and it is not working. <laughs> we are on uh, Spreaker, though. Um, if anybody wants to uh, go to my Facebook page and swipe that link, we uh, we uh, have a we're doing we're doing a live Spreaker link here, live Spreaker broadcast because I can't get to the Fringe Radio Network. Servers, we broadcast old school. This ain't no blob spot radio here, guys. We are uh, we're broadcasting old school uh, manually. I've got a I got broadcast software that uh, uplinks uh, the show to uh, uh, streaming servers around the, all over the internet. And right now, we're only hooked to Spreaker right now. So, but uh, <clears throat> at least uh, maybe perhaps a little later. Um, well, uh, once these guys get going, I can get in the background and try to hook us to the Fringe Network. Uh, Producer Rick is on us about that. He's kind of working on that right now. But anyway, um, so we really got into we got into sort of an intro of the Book of Judges. I mean, we get we didn't get uh, much past the Sons of Anak, as I recall. But um, Anak being the Anakim, the giants. But uh, uh, you know, in the first chapter, I think it's uh, verses one through thirty-six. Basically, um, it basically what it does is it it really sets up the whole scene because um, God told them. You know, I mean, he, Moses told them just as they were going into the you know before he died. You know, he told them, look, if you do all these things, all these 
statutes and keep all God's commandments, then he's going to bless you and you'll always have, uh, you know, the rains will always come and you'll always have an abundance and, you know, you'll always be blessed. And he goes, but if you don't, all this destruction is going to happen. But, and then Moses said just pretty much one of the last things he says is, you know what, you're not going to. You're not going to keep all these commandments and keep all these these rules and statutes. This is what's going to happen. You're going to serve other gods, and God is going to be pretty angry with you, and you're going to reap the whirlwind because of it. And uh, really, we have the setup, I think, in the first chapter, Judges, just because, I mean, it goes into all the geography. It goes, covers, you know, Judah and Benjamin and, you know, and uh, Manasseh and the places they went in the promised land and the people that they f were told to utterly wipe out that they didn't, you know, and, you know, like Rabbi Mike, you know, and, um, he's uh the tribe of benjamin you know they're there's they're supposed to take out the jebusites and obviously you know not even rabbi mike could look could, you know would listen to that because i mean he was told to destroy johnny and take over the iron show or he would find himself in the <laughs> vietnamese facial spa <laughs> so I don't think you need to worry about you having 400 years of idolatry where God decides to take you off the iron show. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, let's, I, I won't live that long, so yeah. Thank God. But um, yeah, so it kind of set, I just want to say it sets up the, the whole scene of the judges because they failed to wipe out the people in the Promised Land, the Canaanites, the Jebusites, the Amorites, um, and uh, all the other ones, and... Uh, and, and they were told that if they didn't, then the problem was if they didn't, what they would mix in with the cultures and end up worshiping their gods, which is what they did. I mean, that's what happened. So that kind of sets up the background of the Book of Judges. Am I wrong? Or? No, that's, uh, that's a good summary of it. Um, it is a, it's a very sad book because it's one of wasted opportunity. It's one of, uh, what it's a book of, you know, could have been, uh, you know, what if Israel had done what it was supposed to do? What if Israel had indeed been a shining light in the midst of a world darkened by idolatry? If, you know, Israel had drawn the nations to learn about Israel's God the way Israel was always intended to. And instead, we find the nations getting into Israel in the sense of the nations dragging Israel away from her God rather than the nations uh, drawing near to the true God. Um, and as we said before, I mean, it's a book that has a lot of parallels to the church's historical situation. The church also has not uh, run the race as well as it could have. Okay, we've had 2,000 years here, and for most of those 2,000 years, we stayed locked down in Europe with only a few uh, Christian centers outside of that instead of spreading over the whole world like we were told to. It's only in the last couple of centuries that you've really seen the uh, activity to take the gospel to all the nations. And, you know, so it, it, for my Sunday brethren, you know, who like to read this, like, oh, those Jews, they didn't get it. Okay, well, let's look at our own history, okay? And it's not a matter of trying to beat up anyone. It's a matter of, look, all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. So when we're reading about these histories, it's an invitation to look in, inward to our own lives and look outward to our own nations and say, where are we falling short? And pray that God sends us a judge, sends God, that God sends us a leader like a Gideon, uh, maybe not a Samson, but <laughs> it's someone that, you know, will lead us back into the way of uh, God's Word. Matthew, Matthew, um, your thoughts? I absolutely agree. Uh, that's how chapter 3 starts out. And, ladies and gentlemen, uh, you don't have to look very far uh, before you see the details of what Rabbi Mike just said, I mean, uh, ladies and gentlemen, this is the 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 church today, the uh, the established church today, is such a far cry from serving the Lord their God. It's kind of gotten to the point that it's not even a discussable issue. Um, you can go to uh, well, just here in town, I have visited three. Um, none of them had anything to do uh, with anything that the scripture says we should be doing toward the lost. Not anything. Uh, they come together uh, a single time a week. Uh, you know, they hang out together, and then it's over until 
uh, the next week time to get together. They don't uh, help the poor. Uh, they don't help widows or orphans. Uh, they don't evangelize. They don't spread the gospel. Um, so it begs the question. I mean, I'm not going to elaborate on uh, such things, but it begs the question. If you could prove in a court of law they are not following the Lord their God, they're obviously serving something. Uh, they're going to that building, that structure, to serve something or someone. And it's obviously uh, not the one whose name it has been established under, uh, which is Christ, of course. Uh, but you go there, and there is no hint or shadow of that at all. Um, the one really upset me. They uh, they didn't even read the Bible. Uh, they got out their, uh, their reading for the week, and they read well i i really can't describe it uh, they just did a, a a reading it was not from the scripture but it was a reading uh you know much like um the jews do you know we all know that they have their daily readings well they're actually reading uh the bible but that's not what they were reading and then they went on to uh discuss these things in well in secular terms uh so when i walked out of that edifice, I, I walked out dumbfounded as to why I had went, because Christ's name was obviously displayed uh, there on the sign, you know, um, that this was a church, uh, you know, affiliated with uh, the Lord Jesus Christ, and yet I did not hear him, I did not see him, I did not feel him. I did in no way, shape, or form experience his spirit. And, well, let me just say this. This Hebrew term, the spirit of the Lord uh, coming over someone, it's right here in the book of Judges. That's where, it, that, that's where that phrase starts, that the spirit of the Lord came over uh, someone or some such a group. It's right here, it starts in Judges. Of course, the first time that exact phrase is used is Judges chapter 3, which is, well, what I just referenced. So, where is all the evangelizing in the Amazon? No, please, tell me. Who is uh, evangelizing uh, the Inuit that uh, is not in the northern continent? What about those in Russia? Uh, who has went to Siberia? Uh, to spread the word of the Lord our God. What about, uh, you know, uh, the back reaches, uh, you know, of the Nile? Uh, what about the jungles? Uh, what about uh, the, uh, the natives uh, there in Australia? Uh, I know that uh, those that speak our language have done quite a lot of things to them, albeit none of them being act like Christ. And not in any way, shape, or form, uh, actually. So, when you think about that, uh, you know, as Rabbi Mike and, and, and Johnny and I continue uh, with this, you really need to take to heart what Rabbi Mike said. Because this is where you're at. Whether you like it or not, this is where you're at. And right now, the church as a whole is not serving the Lord their God. Oh, they may very well be worshipping. They very well may be worshipping. But as I recall, those that do not serve the Lord their God, uh, their worship becomes only a stench in his nostrils. That's what I know. So when well, we consider those things... Else. Let, let me throw something else there. It's not just about you know, worshiping the Lord God and serving Him. It's worshiping and serving only Him. How many of us have divided loyalties? Okay, Israel, when you're looking at the book of Judges, they didn't forget the Lord. They didn't forget Hashem. You know, I, for those who don't know, I don't uh, speak God's holy name because I can't find anywhere where the Messiah himself did it. So, you know, they, don't, they didn't forget the Eternal One, though. Guess what? The Canaanites knew the Eternal One. They called Him El. But they didn't serve only him. They started mingling his worship with the worship of Baal, 
with the worship of Ashtoreth, with the worship of these other gods and goddesses. Why? Because the worship of the gods and goddesses of this world is sensual, sacred sex. You know, you go to the local temple and you sleep with a temple prostitute and you're told that you're sleeping with a god, a goddess. What about America today? We have become a nation of sense freaks. We are bored. I mean, the book of Ecclesiastes was written to America. We've tried everything, and we're bored. And instead of doing what Solomon said, and return, remembering our Creator in the days of our youth, instead keep on going after more and more senses. And the church is as bad about anyone else. The pornography rate among people who claim to be for God, who claim to be Christians, and who claim to be Jews, is absolutely abominable. We distract ourselves with all these other things. It's always God and. Now it's God and political correctness. We justify with, oh, I'm just, I'm being loving without standing firm against sin. And how can people stand firm against sin when they're in sin? That's where we're falling, falling short, people, is that it's God and. A little bit of God on Sunday, but then and the rest of my week is given over to the Xbox, to the PlayStation, to the movies, to, you know, whatever. To the internet. If we want, you know, people say, I want a revival. You know what? That's dangerous. Because when God reveals himself, and we don't respond, God's revelation brings a terrifying judgment. Judges 2, chapter, uh, or Judges chapter 2, verse 1, starts off with the angel of the Lord, the messenger of the Lord, God's holy presence itself, coming up to Hagilgal, the place where God rolled away Israel's reproach, where the children of Israel were circumcised again. Came up from Hagilgal, which had become, we're going to find out in chapter 3, a place of idolatry, even though it was the first camp Israel had in the land, to a place that they called Bochim, weeping. Why? Because the presence of the Lord came to convict the people, and the people did not turn from it. And did not turn from these idols, did not turn from these other gods. God convicted them, they wept, but they didn't turn. By the way, that name there, Gilgal, it's actually Ha-Gilgal, the Gilgal. Which is interesting, because in Ezekiel chapter 10, Ha-Gilgal describes the wheels of the Kerubim that carry the Almighty when he visits his people in exile in Babylon. God doesn't forget his people. His, the God's people forget God. And when God comes and he gives us a chance and he gives us a revelation, he gives us uh, his spirit, he gives us a revival, and then we have a nice little emotional experience and then go back to living the same way we always did, what does that bring? Judgment. God gives, says fine, and he gives us into the hands of our enemies. Where are we today? America hasn't fallen yet. But we're teetering on the brink, and our enemies are gathering. They smell the blood in the water, because we're no longer under the protection of the eternal creator of the universe and his unique son. It says only begotten or one and only in your Bibles. It actually means unique, one and, uh, the unique one. There's no one else like him, the unique son, Yeshua the Messiah, who used to be held in high praise by everyone in this nation. And now, we're embarrassed by him, we drive him out of our public places, and we who believe in him, let it happen. We have no conviction to say, no, I will stand on this. You know, fine, I respect your right not to believe, but I will not let my belief be driven away, and I will continue to stand firm on my belief. And that doesn't mean, by the way, going around and attacking other people who are outside of the body. Paul makes the point, and I'll bring it up again, that we're to judge those in the body, those who claim to be brothers, ahead of those who are outside. We have nothing to do with judging the outside world. We're to call them to repentance. They'll get mad enough at that. But we don't judge ourselves. We don't judge one another to walk in the right way. Church discipline is out the window. People will sue over church discipline now, and we let them do it. Pastors are afraid of losing their, to use the Hebrew term, their machas, their big donators. So they water down their messages. People don't want to rock, rock the boat. The book of Judges is about people who rocked the boat. 
I'm sorry to have, stole, uh, to have stolen your thunder there, Matthew, but tonight and for the rest of this series and hopefully every other time we get together, we're here to rock the boat. Not to give you a nice little message that makes you feel good about yourselves. You guys are bumming me out, well, man. I, I, I need to. I need to get some <laughs> Joel Osteen in here. Your best life now. I gotta. You guys are like. You're like bumming me out, man. Well, it's that kind of day. <laughs> Sorry to. Bump you well, out. I mean, it is that kind of day. Say something that makes me feel good about myself, Matthew. <laughs> All right. That's what I was. Actually, I was exactly getting ready to do that. Uh, okay. <laughs> uh, first off, let me correct. Uh, the good rabbi, uh, he is incorrect in saying, or even insinuating, uh, that he has stolen, uh, what did he say? Uh, my fire? My flame, perhaps? What did you say you stole from me? Your thunder. <laughs> I jumped my th- Oh, my sir. thunder. I am sorry it was his thunder and his alone, because, ladies and gentlemen, let me explain something to you, okay? you got one of two choices. You can either stand and walk in whatever way you want to. You can do that. You'll find yourself on quicksand. Or you can stand upon the rock because he reigns. It is his will and his will alone that shall be not only executed, but shall be accomplished at the end of days. He will stand. The only ones that will be standing with him are the ones whom he himself has set upon the rock. That's it. And it is not mine. It is not Johnny's. It is not Rabbi Mike's. And it's certainly not your pastor's. It is his son's. That's alone. That's it. This is what the book of Judges is all about. And let me tell you this right now. You cry out for great signs. You, you cry out for a great prophet. Come and heal us. Come and perform wonders and make our lame to walk. And all of our IRS accounts equal that we may get to return. Is this not what you say? Is this not what you think? Let me ask you something. It's tax time, is it not? Riddle me this. Did you accept that little piece of paper that the church secretary gave to you with an itemization of how much you had tithed this year so that you could take it back from the Lord your God? How many of you? Riddle me. If you took that, and if you dared to profane yourself, absolutely pollute yourself, and take that off on your taxes so that you could actually take it back from the Lord your God? You're on quicksand indeed. As for me and my house, as for the Johnster that will forever set upon the knee, as for Rabbi Michael Buck, we stand upon the rock and he reigns. And besides him, there is no other. Not any. Not Joel Osteen. Not President Obama. Not the Pope. There is only one. Just one. And if you pollute yourself like a harlot, a harlot you shall be. And a harlot is treated only one way by the Lord their God. Just one. And the book of Judges will tell you all about it. And that's the truth. Johnny? So you, uh... So you think I should amend my schedule... My 1040 long form? Is that what you're saying? I'm going to do what Rabbi Mike made reference to a few minutes ago. I'm going to tell you, you better do what's right. Okay? That's what I'm going to tell you to do. I'm not going to tell you anything about your taxes, how to fill them out, (coughs) which form to fill out. I'm going to tell you to do what's right. I'm going to tell you that if you walk into a bar, 
do what's right. Okay, I'm going to tell you that uh, when you go to the gas station, do what's right. I'm going to tell you when you run across uh, somebody with Down syndrome, do what's right. Do what he would do. That's what I'm telling you to do, Johnny. I actually never thought about um, not claiming uh, contributions to charity on the Schedule A, but that's something to think about. I never even thought about that. I suppose you're right. Um, I know one thing I have thought about, though. I know me and Peter Goodgame were in a restaurant last year, and uh, we were talking a lot about prophecy and stuff, and pretty much the whole restaurant could hear us because Johnny's loud, and Johnny was making Pete loud, and and uh, so I knew without a shadow of a doubt that that uh, and the waitresses were putting us putting up with us. So I knew beyond a shadow of a doubt that I better leave more on the table for a tip than what I paid for the meal. So the meal was ten bucks. I left twenty on the table after paying my bill, and Pete did the same thing. That waitress walked out of there with 40 bucks, and so that's what Christians do, she must think. They must tip really good because they care about me. Hmm. I don't know. That's, uh, a, that's and you know what? I, wor- I waited tables uh, through college, and I can tell you that we all hated the Sunday crowd because we knew that tips were going to be horrible because people were coming from church, and their attitude was, I tithed at church, I'm not doing it here. I'll leave a tract in place of, you know, a dollar. Now, if someone wants to leave a tract with a generous tip, wonderful. There you go. But when people are leaving tracts in place of the tips that, the, you know, the people who are waiting the tables are depending on to pay their bills to make their way through life, that's robbing them in the name of the Lord. What's and your that position? that me to this day. That Uh-oh. people are... Oh. What's your position on Christian tipping in restaurants, Matthew? <laughs> okay, let's let's do this one more time. <laughs> what would Jesus do exactly? He'd leave a big tip. Oh, for the love of Pete. <laughs> what would Samuel do? Leave a big tip. What would Abraham do? Leave a big tip. No matter what they do, what was right? Yeah, they'd leave a great big huge tip, and they wouldn't leave a track which isn't worth the paper it's printed on. They might leave a pocket New Testament. Uh Uh-oh, am I really stinging you? Let me get this right. You go to church and you get free tracts. You don't even pay anything for it. And you're going to leave that, which you've gotten for free, that isn't worth the paper it's printed on, instead of what... Oh my goodness, instead of what you owe them. We all know the rules of gratuity, don't we? Do not insult my intelligence! Everybody knows that all waiters and waitresses must claim that 15%. That's why a lot of restaurants will automatically put the 15% on there. And you're not going to give it to... What? Yeah, that's a double slap, huh? Yes. Oh, look, look. Look, look. You are a stench in his nostrils. Okay? I'm just going to tell you. Come to my house. I'll be happy to tell you to your face. You're a stench. You are not what you say you are. You're something else. Well, you serve something else. And I don't know how to put that to you politely or gently. Other than the way I just have. Um, Johnny, it, right, it, let, me put it, look, let me break it down real simple here. Yeshua said... The worker deserves their wages. God's law says you don't even delay in giving someone what they are owed in their pay. And so if you withhold a tip from someone who has served you, knowing that's the custom, knowing that is how they make their living, you have committed a sin against that person and a sin against God. Now the rabbis teach that Yom Kippur clears away your sins against God, but not against your fellow man unless you go and make it right to them first. Yeshua himself said, if you're bringing a sacrifice to the temple, you remember your brother has something against you, you have to go make it right first and then come make your sacrifice. What's that mean? It means, you know, you realize you tipped someone wrong, you didn't tip someone enough, and you're like, oh Lord, I'm sorry. 
No, you have to go back to that person. You have to find that person, and you have to pay them what they what you owe them to be really right with God. No, I'm not saying you're going to go to hell over a tip. I am saying that if you want to be right with God, you want to do what Yeshua, what Jesus told you to do, you have to go find the person you robbed and pay them what you owe them. Plus, extra, because the Bible says that if you rob someone, you have to pay them the extra on it. To, you know, basically the interest on that robbery. It's not enough to just, you know, oh, I'm sorry, I'll do better next time because you have taken something from that person. And if they saw you with a Bible or bowing your heads, then you have taken from God because you have blasphemed the name of God by your actions. Think about that for a second. Something as simple as how generously you tip can either praise the name of God or blaspheme the name of God. And do not think people don't notice. I have a lot of friends who put themselves through college, myself included, waiting on tips. They know who the good tippers were. And it wasn't the Christians. It's pretty sad, isn't and it? And they remember that, and that has added in their mind against the reasons why they don't want to follow the God that these Christians follow. Right. Right. Let's bring that up. Okay, let's bring that up. This is the very type of reason that they hate his name. Don't you realize you have shamed the name of the Son of the Living God? Oh, yeah. Don't you realize what you have done? Uh, wow. I mean, don't, don't you realize you have made these people the very people that he came for? He didn't come for you! He came for for the lost. You claim to be found. Oh, I'm sure you're found that you smell funny. And let me put it to you politely. Don't you know that goats have a little gland in their hoof? And you may very well be in the flock of the Lord. But guess what, baby? You're not going to like it very much when you show up to the end game and he says, huh, I don't want no goats in my flock. Oh, am I lying? Have you estranged yourself so much from his word that you don't even know what he said about you? Because that is what he said, man. So I don't... I mean, look. As God is my witness, if any of you had done this and you told me, I'd be more than happy to go back to whoever you'd done this to and give him a tip myself just to try to snatch the son of the living God's good name from the fire because you have shamed it so I go back and I said hey man this, this person's a Christian they're also an idiot but they're a Christian and here man we you know they told me about it and you know they they didn't know they should tie so here I, I'm paying it for you it's actually really good advice you know if you happen to be with a group of Christians and they're not leaving a big enough tip well I'm telling you, you it's up to you if you know better Stuff like that. I mean, that's just one area, you know, but you'd be surprised some of the areas that will really either glorify God or or blaspheme Him. You know, simple things like that. Really, being, <clears throat> being mean. I mean, that's another thing. Being rude or mean or, or um, you know, unapproachable. Boy, there's another one. I guess a... I guess we could go off on that. That's something that really bugs me. <laughs> you know, I it's just I doubt I don't doubt people. Things, you know? <laughs> I don't doubt people's Christianhood if they're sinning. I doubt their Christianhood if they're buttholes. <laughs> <laughs> well, look at this way. It's about, uh, I better edit that one. <laughs> I think we we all agree. We all agree that works cannot earn. A place in the world to come. Works no. do not earn God's good grace or forgiveness. Okay, because if it were, it wouldn't be grace. But Yeshua Himself said, "Works are the fruit." If you have real faith, and, and understand, the Greek word for faith is pistis. It has two meanings: to believe in and trust in, and to be faithful towards, to be loyal towards. 
words. If you honestly trust God and you're honestly loyal towards him, that is going to come out in your actions. It's not about, you know, going to church once a week. It's not about, you know, making a little, uh, you know, once in a while you do something nice, whatever. It is about the pattern of your life is going to show the evidence of that trust and faithfulness. Yes, you will screw up. We all do. That's okay. That's why part of the reason Messiah came, his blood covers the honest mistakes. But guess what? When we screw up, we have an obligation to go back and try to fix it. Okay. We have an obligation to go above and beyond in the name of our king. And we have an obligation to stand firm. Not to let the world change how we live, who we worship, the fact that we worship him alone. Okay. The world is very good at getting into our lives that way. We get busy. Sometimes it sneaks up on you. God understands that. Once you realize that getting busy and too busy to spend time with the Lord has caught up on you, you are obligated to go and fix that. Okay. It, one of the things that it, you know, Torah teaches, God says in Leviticus, when he's talking about the sin offering and the... Uh, um, uh, the uh, trespass offering it says when you do something like you know you became unclean and didn't realize it went onto holy ground or you know you committed some other sin it says and you realize it you are guilty if you just flat out don't realize you've done something wrong God doesn't hold that to your account but if you later look back on and go whoa I goofed that up you're guilty okay and as a result, you are obligated to go back and try to make that right. If, it inv if you sinned against another person, you want to make it right to that person. I've got a gentleman that I accidentally walked off with some of his money uh, a couple of years ago. It wasn't intentional. You know, we were shuffling stuff around, and he later confronted me with the fact that I had uh, pocketed some of his money. I have an envelope with his name on it, and unfortunately he moved away and I haven't been able to find him yet. Herman, if you're listening to this by chance, okay, I don't have your current number. Get in touch with me. I think you've still got my email because I owe you money. That money has been set aside to be returned to you because I accidentally robbed you. It was not my intent. But by doing so, I actually damaged the name of the Lord. And I really wish that I can, I pray for the day that he, I can run into him again so that I can make that right. I didn't know I did it at the time. It was not an intentional robbery. But I'm responsible for that because I've become made aware of it. That's the way we're supposed to live. It, when we realize we mess up, we go make it right. If Christians all over the world, and Jews, and Messianic Jews, all around the world, when we messed up, we went back in humility and said, I'm sorry, let me make this right consistently, it'd be a lot harder for the world to persecute us and slander us and blaspheme us. And more to the point, to persecute and slander and blaspheme our Lord, who we represent. You know, we talk blithely about being God's children. Do you know what it is to be a son or a daughter of God? To In the Bible, to be a son of God is to be a direct creation of God for the purpose of bearing his image. The angels are called sons of God because God directly created them. They don't procreate for the express purpose of bearing his image. Adam is called God's son in Luke because Adam was directly created by God for the purpose of bearing God's image. In other words, to represent God. Israel is called God's son even as firstborn because the nation as a whole was directly created by God for the purpose of bearing his image, of representing him. The Messiah is the unique son of God because he's the only one that gets it right. Because he is the divine word and wisdom and presence and personality made flesh. And so he perfectly represents his father. But he has this whole thing of baptism, of symbolically dying and rising again, that is symbolizing what happens in actuality in the spirit. This is why Paul says, you become a new creation you become a direct creation of the Father. Not simply cro procreated from human beings, but a direct creation of the Father. His Spirit living in you. Why? To be conformed to the image of His Son, so that you can be an image of the living God. 
God doesn't have idols. He has children. And for all of you who call yourselves your ch his children, and this is one of those occasions where you, I point a finger and three more point back at me. You trust me. <laughs> for all of us that call ourselves God's children, we are under an obligation to live our lives in a way that we are his images, that we properly represent him. And we're not doing that in this country right now. Some of us are. There's some good people out there. I, yes, there are. Absolutely. Okay. And, you know, and I'll let others judge whether I do that well enough or not. But the, the fact is that, um, at, by and large, Christians in this country haven't been challenged in a very long time. Okay, we've gotten you. We've gotten comfortable in this idea that oh, you know, you know, we're uh, uh, oh, the country. Is, it's a Christian country. No, it's not. It hasn't been for a while now. Okay, and we need to stop pretending that everyone's a Christian and that everyone in the country is under God's rule, the kingdom of God. We have to understand that even those who call themselves Christians by and large are not truly in the kingdom of God, and we need to reach out and find those people. Those who call themselves Christians, we need to convict. Those who call themselves Messianic Jews, we really need to convict. I'll be the first to say that Messianics can be some of the worst uh, in terms of hypocrisy and pride out there. Those, But we need to convict. We need to discipline. We need to be blunt. God says that if you, in Leviticus 19, if you do not confront your brother to his face when you see him sinning, you hate your brother and you join in his sin. That's what Yeshua said the second most important commandment is. Love your neighbor as yourself is in the middle of that commandment. We are to rebuke each other frankly so that we will learn, so that we will draw each other away from sin and exhort each other into being the images we're supposed to be. But for the rest of the world, the ones who are not in the body, the ones who are not our brethren yet, we're not to go out and attack their sin in the sense of attacking specific sins, in the sense of trying to point and say, I'm better than that person over there. We are to be the images of God, to live uprightly ourselves, to live above reproach ourselves, so that our God will be above reproach, so that we may draw some of them who are honestly looking and want to know the living God in their heart of hearts, even if they don't realize it themselves. They want to know the living God. God has already put that on them. They need to see him in us so they can come and they can be saved. And you know what? The whole world is coming into America right now. You don't have to go to the Amazon or to the Middle East to find people to witness to anymore. I live in Gwinnett County, which is the most diverse county in the United States. I am a few miles away from the fifth largest Hindu temple in the world. I pass two mosques on my way to work. You don't have to go that far to find the mission field. It's here. The boundary lines are closing in because the adversary is pressing in, and that means that the people that we are called to witness to are here. Yes, we should support missionaries because we have a great commission to fulfill, but you have a personal obligation to present your king to the people that are coming to us now. We're not doing that. And the best way to do that is with mercy and actions and and yes. attitude, really. Matthew, um, let me ask you a question here because um, I think I, I want to I want to know if I understand this verse right. We're here in Judges two one, um, and an angel of the Lord came up from Gilgal to Bochim and said, "I made you go up out of Egypt." And I have brought you into the land which I swore unto your fathers. And I said, I will never break my covenant with you. Um, that's basically, and uh, that's basically a statement. We know the children of Israel broke their covenant. We know a lot of people have broken the covenant. But I was gonna, Matthew. Um, uh, when God's, this is a statement of God. He never has broken the covenant, right? He's saying, on the, uh, as for me, I'm going to be faithful. Or do I have that wrong? No, you have that correct. That's illicitly what he said. I will never break my covenant with you. Now, you said, well, first off, you predicated this statement with the Lord. Uh, it says the angel of the Lord. He represents Lord, though, Let's I mean, right? He's speaking for him in that case. Well, 
right or not? Where does it say here that he's speaking for God? It never says that. Don't they always? No, that's not what it says. Okay. Uh, so you're saying uh, that an angel never has the opportunity to not speak for the Lord. Now, every time an, an angel is definitively relaying a message from God, uh, that angel always says so. The Lord specifically says that the Lord wants you to do this or say this or do this. That's not what this angel says. <laughs> oh, I'm missing something. Then. Okay, so explain that then. Well, well, obviously because you asked me the question wrong. I mean, like I said, this is an angel of the Lord speaking. So let's just say this is, you know, uh, Michael or Gabriel that made this statement. But it never says that's what God said. It says this angel that had, of course, witnessed this covenant. Uh, me and Rabbi Mike talked about it last time, or, or just Rabbi Mike did, I think. I think he mentioned it. Uh, the simple fact that everything that has to do with this place. This angel, right here, he's speaking. Not the Lord his God. This, this is what he's saying. He's saying, I, I will never. I mean, right there it's pretty clear. At, at least it is in, you know, uh, in the Hebrew language. Uh, it's not written like it. It is, of course, in English. Uh, so that's what got me, is that you asked me the wrong question. You asked me a question that does not per pertain to this verse at all. Not at all. So why is the angel it never acting? Says, why, I mean, angel, angels don't make covenants with men, do they? Or do they? Well, it's... Well, <laughs> where did this all begin? I, I talked about that on the, on the previous episode, or... I can't remember if I talked about it or if it was Rabbi Mike, but uh, we pointed out the simple fact that uh, they got together, crossed, made a covenant. Remember? Okay. We went. To, we went into great detail about that. This is that angel, okay, that witnessed them making that covenant with a pillar of stones. Okay. So. Uh, if you really want to go somewhere with this, uh, uh, we all know that it is Michael that has been uh, declared as your prince. Now that we know that for sure. Okay? Uh, the angel Gabriel actually told us that. Uh, made reference to Michael being, of course, uh, Israel's prince. So, that being the case, if I was going to uh, step outside my boundaries and... Uh, hypothesize and I would be very direct with you I would guess this would be Michael that's what I thought however however it doesn't tell me that so I'm not gonna go there right but I am gonna say this uh, this angel okay had just witnessed the uh, erection uh, of these stones as a pillar the covenant was made and all of a sudden he's like what are you doing why have you done this? Okay. It was my stipulation uh, only to protect you as long as, you know, uh, you were kosher. Right. The angel steps up to the plate and points out, hey, you smell funny. You don't smell like a sheep to me. Okay. That's basically what happened right here. Now, you can plainly see that in Hebrew. Now, I know a lot of the English translations, I don't know them all off the top of my head but a lot of them will, will will try to you know put that into the text that this is god speaking no it's not it's an angel and it says it's an angel yeah albeit it is an angel of the lord but yeah. uh he's definitely not uh relaying a message uh, he's not telling uh, you know giving instruction uh he's speaking right here and it's perfectly plain in the text uh, that he is speaking for himself i he says, "I." But I mean, Which, that's what the but but he's he's saying what God did because when he says, "I made you go up out of Egypt and have brought you into the land which I swore unto your fathers," I mean, God is the one who right. did that. So okay, we have to like just assume. Sure. I mean, I would assume that 
he was speaking on behalf of no, God I wouldn't. because of that. Well, let's remove well, assumption for a moment because what? this guy, well, he, this angel, appears a little bit later. Okay, well, well let, we let Matthew continue on that because he was about to explain that okay. to me. Yeah. Right, I'm about to explain this. The Lord your God said this concerning this particular angel. You had better obey him because he does not have to forgive you because my name is in him. Did not the Lord your God say that, Johnny? Yes, he did in the Exodus. The Lord your God warned the Israelites, now listen, you had better pay attention to uh, the angel that is going before you because if you don't, he don't have to forgive you because my name is in him. Rabbi Mike, am I correct or incorrect? You are correct. You're absolutely okay. Correct. So and here we go talk again, John. What the Shem, let's talk about what the Shem, the name is. For the, for people that are not used to thinking in those terms, because you know most people are like, oh, name. That's a sound. That's a sound that represents a person. No, the Shem in Hebrew is a lot more. Do you want to take that, or do you want me to run with it? Oh, please do, Rabbi Mike. I think I'm a little bit uh, irritated beyond my uh, proper uh, mode to be able to restrain myself. So why don't, why don't okay. you talk about that? But I'm going to agree with everything you say, okay? Uh, because you're exactly right. Because, like I said, I better sit down and shut up on this one. Why don't you take it? <laughs> All right. In Hebrew, the, the word for name in Hebrew is Shem. That's why you will hear Jews when they come, when they're talking about the sacred name, the four-letter word, instead of pronouncing it according to the words, they will typically say Hashem. You hear me do that sometimes because I've just gotten the habit of doing that so as not to offend. Um, it just means Ha, the, Shem, name. Okay. But what does a name mean? A name means several things. We actually, one of them means the authority. We actually uh, use that in English, okay? You, you'll see, like, you know, something about Robin Hood where someone will say, in the name of the king, or, you know, stop in the name of the law. What's it talking about? It's talking about the authority of the king, the authority of the law, right? The same thing is true in the Hebrew Shem. So God's saying of this angel that's going to go for Israel, my authority is in him. But it goes more than that. The name is the reputation of Again, this crosses over into English, where the name, you know, we talk about someone having a good name, a good reputation, okay? So this being that carries the name of God carries the honor and the reputation of God. But there's more. The name of a person represents the totality of the person, in particular the personality. Okay. In Hebrew, there's a sense of the name not just being a, an arbitrary set of syllables that happen to represent the person. It is the person. It is the personality. So what's God saying about this angel? This, and by the way, angel, malach in Hebrew, angelos in the uh, in Greek, simply means messenger. So God's saying that this messenger going, you know, get away from this idea that it means a species. God says this messenger he has my authority in him. He has my honor in him. You will treat him with the same honor you treat me. And he has my being, my personality in him. Wow. That is not just a guy with wings and a halo. Okay. Now. We're going to go a little bit, we're going to hop forward in the book of Judges. We seem to be avoiding actually hitting the verses of the book of Judges, but let's, let's do this and let's hop forward a little bit. Everyone remembers the story of Samson. Everyone remembers that Samson's hair was vital to his strength and that when his hair was cut, that uh, this eliminated his power. A lot of people don't remember why. Samson, like John the Baptist later, was a Nazarite completely dedicated to the Lord from birth, and as a sign of that, his hair was never to be cut. They, his parents didn't just come up with this on their own. And Judges 13, chapter 2 says, Then the angel of the Lord appeared to the woman and said to her, Behold, now you are barren and have borne no children, but you will conceive and give birth to a son. Now, be caref now therefore be careful not to drink wine or strong drink, nor eat any unclean thing, for behold, you will conceive and give birth to a son, and no razor shall come on his head, 
For the boy will be a Nazrite, a dedicated one to God from the womb, and he shall begin to deliver Israel from the hands of the Philistines. Notice it doesn't say he'll complete it, because God knew that Samson was going to mess this up. Now, so the woman and her husband Manoah go to offer a sacrifice to the Lord. And what does it say? It goes, you know, skipping ahead down to verse uh, 16. The angel of the Lord said to Manoah, Though you detain me, I will not eat your food, but if you prepare a burnt offering, then offer it to Hashem. Offer it to the Eternal One. Offer it to the Lord. For Manoah did not know that he was the angel of the Lord. So this guy appears as a normal human. Manoah said to the angel of the Lord, What is your name? And so that when your words come to pass, we may honor you. But the angel of the Lord said to him, Why do you ask my name? Seeing as it is wonderful. Or, you could just translate that as, my name is wonderful. So, Manoah, it, the, by the way, that word in Hebrew also means incomprehensible. So, Manoah took the young goat with the grain offering and offered it on the rock to the Lord. And he performed wonders while Manoah and his wife looked on. For it came about that when the flame went up from the altar towards heaven, that the angel of the Lord ascended in the flame of the altar. That Manoah and his wife saw this, they fell on their faces on the ground. Now the angel of the Lord did not appear to Manoah his wife again. Then Manoah knew he was the angel of the Lord. So Manoah said to his wife, We will surely die, for we have seen God. But his wife said to him, If the Lord had des desired to kill us, he would not have accepted a burnt offering and a grain offering from our hands, nor would he have shown us all these things, nor would he have let us hear things like this at this time. So what's, what are they saying? They recognize that the being they met, this messenger of the Eternal One, was a manifestation, an emanation, a person, to use the Christian term, of the Eternal Creator Himself. Now, going back to chapter 2, the, this same angel of the Lord comes from Ha Gilgal. Again, that same word appears in reference to the chariot that carries the Eternal One himself when he goes to meet his people in Babylon, and Ezekiel sees it. And the angel says, I brought you up out of Egypt and led you into the land which I have, I have sworn to your fathers. And I said, I will never break my covenant with you. Therefore, you will make no covenant with the inhabitants of this land, and you shall tear down those altars, but you have not obeyed me. Why does it say the angel of the Lord? Because it's making it very clear, just as Solomon said. Solomon built the temple so that God could dwell in it. But Solomon said, can this temple really hold you? The heavens of heavens aren't enough to contain you. Solomon understood that it was only... One minute part, one ray of light, one projection of the Lord into this world that was interacting with his people. Be like, uh, the illustration I like to use is, I build an ant farm, I want to interact with the ants. If I try to show them my whole self by throwing myself on the ant farm, I kill all the ants and destroy their world. So, maybe I put my finger in it. That finger is me. It is my messenger, but it's not all of me. That's what we're looking at here. God, it doesn't say well, God himself came because the sins of the people were such that he that he was not coming in the same glory as he came when, for example, he dedicated the tabernacle and dwelt in the tabernacle, where they couldn't even approach it because of the light and the cloud. The sins of the people, God sends his messenger, God is in the messenger, his name is in the messenger. But it's not the same manifestation as they could have had if they had not been sinning. Matthew? Well, if everybody listened to everything he said, um, well, uh, the people that, yeah, they, they, <clears throat> that listen to me have... <clears throat> Go ahead. <laughs> Matthew? Uh, yes. <clears throat> Let me finish coughing. Sorry. Um, ladies and gentlemen, that's why the only title I have for this particular uh, angel is the Exodus Angel. 
uh, if you listen to that diatribe that, that Rabbi Mike just gave, um, lots of things that I've done, lots of things I've written, I always refer to this, uh, this particular uh, messenger as the Exodus angel. He, he comes right out and says that. I am the one that uh, did this and did that. Uh, so the only proper uh, term uh, that I have found uh, to use him as far as my own opinion is concerned is the title uh, of this angel being the Exodus angel. Uh, and as you can see, uh, he can be quite cantankerous uh, based upon what God said originally about him. He doesn't have to forgive you and, and yada, 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 yada. So, uh, Johnny, if you really uh, want my heartfelt opinion, uh, that's the only uh, title you can give him because he himself says this. Uh, my name is Wondrous. Uh, so, uh, he pretty well uh, let everybody know, and, and everybody, I mean everybody throughout all of time, uh, this being the Word of God, pretty much let you know, I'm not going to let you know what my name is. Now, I said earlier that uh, it, it may perhaps, as a good guess, be Michael. However, that says Prince. It says, Michael, you're Prince. So, what you're really talking about here uh, is uh, Michael would uh, thereby be a servant of this one, uh, as far as a military operation would be concerned, like a a, uh, how would I put that, an enlisted soldier or someone of lesser rank than this particular entity. And I like the way that, that Rabbi Mike described the name, because you need to understand uh, a little bit historically what that meant. Whoever had the seal of the king had the king's name. Now, when we look prophetically fast forward, of course... You're going to come to an angel who has the seal of the living God that goes about and seals his servants. So, <laughs> uh, I just wanted to throw that little tidbit in there because in the Hebrew Bible, uh, the Delitz translation, that's why that exact word there for wondrous, you can find that in the book of Revelation, of course. Just so everybody knows <laughs> uh, that it's left there, right there in uh, uh, Revelation chapter 15 it is verse 3 um, it, I'm not going to quote the verse because I can't remember but it's the one, uh, remember when uh, they start singing the song of Moses, the bond servant of God uh, and he says uh, uh, great and marvelous are your works, well right there in that verse is this word for wondrous mm -hmm. now just take note that the Delitz translation was written before the establishment is Hebrews, the modern language, the official language of Israel. It's written in biblical Hebrew. You need to look that up. Matter of fact, it bears the testimony because most uh, Jews that have been converted unto Christianity uh, just go back and ask. Uh, exclusively, they use the Delitz translation. Uh, I've ran into literally hundreds of them. And they say, oh, I won't even touch anything other than the Delitz translation. And because most specifically during its 10th edition, uh, it was, of course, uh, edited by the foremost uh, Hebrew scholar at the time, uh, which uh, everybody might want to look into that because that's probably why he didn't ascend to the top of his establishment uh, there in the academic community. But uh, we need to weigh those things that that this particular angel uh it his he carries the name and that means a whole lot more than you know what us idiot americans think um and that's why the scripture goes to great lengths you know and and rabbi mike will probably be first to tell you this because he does use the name hashem you you hear him use it all the time you know Ladies and gentlemen, you need to think about the, pr the President of the United States. Would you walk up and call him by his first name? Oh, no, you better not. Okay? Especially uh, if there's <laughs> any military guard around. You're going to wish they hadn't. You don't address the Lord your God proper. Just don't do that. Okay, when you go up to the Lord your God, you say, Daddy. <laughs> okay, you don't, uh, you know, I would not uh, walk up to my dad and if his name was Larry, say, Hey, Larry, how's it going? 
Yeah, I... My dad wore I, me out. I'm but. offended by a lot of these guys that keep calling him Yahweh and spell it in capital letters and say it over and over again. I think it's disrespectful. For some reason that I can't explain, it offends me. And I always say, hey, you're not supposed to say his name. What are you doing? Especially on base page 20,000 times. I'm just taking it lightly. Well, and it, it's where I would disagree with some academics that, you know, they use uh, pronunciation of the name to uh, distinguish God from, you know, other gods when they're discussing him academically. But, you know, to me, it comes down to very simple. It, one of the big debates about God's name is we're not 100% sure how, what the vowels are. Guess what? No. Because no. Greek has vowels. If the apostles wanted to tell us what the name was, they could have told us. <laughs> They didn't write it down. Oh, yes, they could have. So what are we doing just casually writing it down in English? I don't know about you, Matthew, but um, what I know, well, what if, what would you, what would your be your attitude if one of your kids called you by your first name? Oh, I ought to get some of them on here. (laughs) Oh, yes, Levi has done it. You should ask him what daddy did to straighten out his kinks. (laughs) I know you didn't do that with my dad. That was worse than anything you could say to him. Well, that's disrespectful. And and l- l- let me say this for all the academics. You, by default, shame him. Okay? By default. There is no other gods. Okay? Y- have you ever heard me refer to God's proper name when I'm talking about, I don't know, Tom, Dick, or Harry, or Bell? I mean, same same equal level uh michael or gabe no 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 no. okay there is god there is no gods plural no you've you've only proven yourself to be what you truly are that's what you've done okay there is only one just one there's no such thing as a plural form of the word god there's just one so you insult yourself you insult me, you insult all Christianity. You insult his son. Okay? There is no other gods. There is only one. Okay? So, by you belittling his name and using it in a sentence with any other entity like Zeus. Okay? Like, uh, I don't know, make one up. I don't care. Uh, uh, Let's just say uh, one might be a Pippi Longstocking. If you use that name in reference to a (laughs) deity that someone worships and the name of the Lord your God, you're shaming him. That's what you're doing. Like I said, you may very well be in his flock, but guess what? You smell funny. You're a goat. And from time to time, I think it's, it's important for the listener to know what I'm talking about. But uh, well, I don't like even doing it then. I mean, I'm willing to do it maybe once in a show to, because people don't know what you're talking about if you don't tell them. But you guys, I well, I don't ever expect you to use his name. Well, you, you be <laughs> because I am what I say I am. Yeah. I mean, just come ask Levi; he'll tell you. Uh, but <clears throat> understand this, ladies and gentlemen, this is the marvelous thing about this. These idiots that run around and try to pronounce his name, you can't do it. Because that's not going to be done until the Lord your God decides to straighten out the language and gives you a pure language. Guess what he's talking about? Then you'll know what the vowels are in Hebrew, and not until then. Then you will have a pure, a pure language, and you will be able to read it and be able to speak it. Right now, you can't. You can't. And I love how everybody asks me about the Strongs, you know. So I'll tell them, so really, what's the next one? Well, wait a minute. That's the same exact word, and they've just put their little jots and tittles on it. How do they know to pronounce it differently? They don't. They never did. And you want to know why? Because if God would have, all these idiots would be running around shaming his name, saying, you know, the, uh, uh, the such and such name, or let me just talk like uh, Rabbi Mike. They might say Hashem, you know, his name, and then also the uh, uh, the god Baal. Okay? So I'm glad I don't know. I'm glad that he has secured himself as holy, even his name. We can't touch it. 
run around babbling. I don't care. That's what you're doing. You're babbling. You no more know how to pronounce the name of the Lord your God than you could detect your own scent. Yeah. Is everybody shocked? Nope. You know, it's amazing. Johnny, it's amazing how if you stink, somebody else has got to tell you, right? Yeah. Let's say you live 500 cats. This is the truth, ladies and gentlemen. I've gone into houses to work on that house. There were cats running everywhere, and I could barely breathe. Oh, yeah. But the occupant of that house didn't even know there was a bad smell in there. Mm -hmm. That's what you are right now. (laughs) That's how you are right now. You can't oh, know. And, That's something to think yeah, about, yeah. Matthew. There will be a wow. day when we'll be able to pronounce God's name. How do I know? Because right. in Revelation, it talks about the fact that you know, God, it, you know, I will give him a new stone, a white stone, and a new name. The name can also mean a renewed name. In Philadelphia, I will write on him the name of my God. In the name of the city, my God, I believe that we're going to be given the correct pronunciation after our king returns. Okay, it's just not now. It's been. It's one of those things that, for the sake, of, I mean, think about it for a second. How many people use the name Jesus as a curse word? Right. Okay. This is one of the reasons I tend to favor Yeshua because it's not entered in popular culture as something that you say casually as a as a curse word or anything like that. So the. Uh, you know how much worse would it be if God's proper name was used was like well known and everyone knew how to pronounce it and was in the popular culture? What would people be doing with it? Yeah. So let's not put it out there in the popular culture where it's just you know used casually. Or what's worse okay. is New Agers and sorcerers using the name to you know to to bring power to their to their spell or whatever. The, that would be really bad. Yeah, I mean, one of the books I've got in my collection is a book of just random letters and other things from the first century. It's, just, it's a really nifty book for just sort of getting a flavor of what was going on in the time of the Book of Acts. And one of the things it has in there is a translation of uh, some uh, Greek exorcist uh, ritual where he's tr- invoking the name of the Hebrew God to try to drive the demon out, and he sits. There, you can sit there, see him. You can you can just see him sitting there writing down every possible permutation he could think of of how to pronounce God's name to try and make his little magic spell work. Hoping he gets it right. Way, he threw, it, <laughs> even a, oh, even a blind squ- even a blind squirrel can find a nut once in a while. Yeah, I mean, that's the thing. Oh, like, he grief. may well get it right somewhere in there, but the point is that he was trying to use it for magic. This is the whole reason we stopped using the name in public to begin with. This is the whole reason why the Book of Esther only has God's name in code, because they knew it was going to be published among the Persians. They didn't want everyone using it. Okay, so we should guard the sanctity of God's name by not being casual about it. So There is power in the name. I mean, if you could speak it, absolutely. there would be power in it. Well, that's the thing. There is power in the name, but it's not a magic spell. I mean, this is what uh, they'll play around with what's called uh, practical Kabbalah, where they're trying to use, oh, I've got these secret names of God, oh, therefore they get power. It's like, no! Yeah. What are you thinking? You, congratulations, you're doing with, you know, the creator of the universe, what pagans do with their gods. Way to go. You know. <laughs> And, you know, it, yes, that gets adopted very quickly by the New Agers and the cultists and everyone else out there. So, no, I don't particularly want God's name and the exact pronunciation to be known at this point. Well, look, that's why I am so thankful uh, that, well, here, let me just read it for you. Um, uh, <laughs> my decision is to gather nations, to assemble kingdoms, to pour out on them my indignation. All my burning anger. For all the earth will be devoured by the fire of my zeal. For then, future tense, I will give my peoples a purified lips that all of them may call on the name of the Lord to serve him shoulder to shoulder. And so, it, Ladies and gentlemen, if you're wondering when you're going to be able to say his name, he tells you. Read Zephaniah chapter 3. Just do it. Just do it. Then you'll know how to pronounce his name. He just told you. But 
<laughs> I'm sorry, you didn't believe him, did you? That's what we're really talking about here, Johnny. These people that run around. Okay? The ones you saw, the ones that you saw do this, they don't know that in doing so, they have put themselves in the camp that's going to get the full fire of his zeal. I'm just telling you what he said with his own mouth. Everybody else, he says, will stand for him shoulder to shoulder. They will do what? Serve him shoulder to shoulder. So, ladies and gentlemen, if you're running around doing what Johnny has seen... Just so you know, you are the ones referred to that have been reserved for judgment. And God just told you with his own mouth. So, um, I, I, I implore upon you that the only way for me to snatch you from the fire is thus. Please read Zephaniah chapter 3 and believe what the Lord your God says with his own mouth. Just believe it. Run with that. At least that's safe. You don't have to understand it. Just believe it. You know, Matthew, the reason the book of Judges is my favorite book in the Bible is because, to me, it's an expression of God's faithfulness and endurance and, and long-suffering. And it's really, it's 13 Corinthians in a, in a, in a gigantic 300-year-long saga and uh to um try to illustrate that since we're reading i would like you matthew to read judges 2 12 to through 2 16 all righty 2 12 through uh, 2 16 okay and uh through 16. So you want me to read 16 or not yeah. read 16? Yeah, finish with 16 loudly. Okay. <laughs> loudly. <laughs> Amen. I'll do that. Starting with verse... <laughs> starting with verse 12. You sure you don't want me to start with verse 11? Isn't that where the stanza? Sure, go right. ahead. Yeah, do it. All right. Yeah. Then the sons of Israel did evil in the sight of the Lord. And served the Baals. And they forsook the Lord their God of their fathers, who had brought them out of the land of Egypt, and followed other gods from among the gods of the peoples who were around them, and bowed themselves down to them. Thus they provoked the Lord to anger. So they forsook the Lord, and served Baal and Ashtoreth. The anger of the Lord burned against Israel, and he gave them into the hands of plunderers, who plundered them, and he sold them into the hands of their enemies around them, so that they could no longer stand before their enemies. Wherever they went, the hand of the Lord was against them for evil. As the Lord had spoken, and as the Lord had sworn to them, so that they were severely distressed. Then the Lord raised up judges, who delivered them from the hands of those who plundered them. Hallelujah, amen. Hallelujah, amen. I that last part myself. He is faithful. <laughs> right on. Yeah, in the King James, it says, Nevertheless, nevertheless, the Lord raised up judges which delivered them out of the hand of those that spoiled them. So in spite of all his anger and all his judgment, he still remained faithful to them, raising up judges to deliver them. Time after time after time. And after time. Yeah, and this is a... But you know what they... No, go ahead. Uh, I need to point this out. They didn't get what they wanted. No, but... Okay, because uh, they, they most desired was for he himself to get involved, which is like he did during the Exodus, right? Oh, I hadn't thought of that. But they were not permitted that. Oh, no. they weren't permitted that. They were only permitted judges. But he did use the judges to deliver them time. Amen, he did. Time after time after time. It just shows his and mercy. And they wouldn't listen. No, they wouldn't listen. 
you know, and they do it. They slip back into uh, brutality. We're not talking about like what you guys would think of sin. We're talking about sacrificing children and massive orgies to other gods. And I mean, we're talking about some wicked, wicked stuff. You know, but God. I'm L.A. here, people. It's, this is worse than L.A. <laughs> I don't know. Between the abortion industry and massive orgies, I think we pretty much described L.A. <laughs> <laughs> First Californians. <laughs> oh, yeah. That's just... I, mean, I, laugh, I laugh so I don't cry, but, you know, yeah. it's, it, it, I mean, you think about it, you know, we talk about sacrificing children to Moloch. Okay, great. We sacrifice them to convenience. And you sit there and so much as try to just put the abortion industry in the exact same rules that people who want to, who need to remove your tonsils to save your life are under, and everyone's up in arms because they're terrified that you know the rate of slaughter might slow down a little bit. I mean, I'm sorry. It, it, some of the stuff that goes on with the abortion industry and the pro-abortion crowd makes no sense unless they are deliberately trying to sacrifice as many children to taint the land. Remember. Innocent blood taints the land. There, you know, from the very beginning, yeah. Cain kills Abel, and what's God say? Your brother's blood cries out from to me from the ground, and now it's not going to yield its produce to you. God said of Israel, if you follow the sins of the people that were in the land, it will vomit you out the same way it vomited them out. You know, it's Violent interesting. Violent sin taints. It has a physical, spiritual effect where it takes place. Oh, yeah. I mean, you start with Cain and Abel hard. right there. Started with Cain and Abel. Yeah. Your blood cries out to me from the ground. There's a lot of example where innocent blood it was shed and it wrecked the land. It cursed the land. There's a lot of examples of that. Mm-hmm. There's, um, you know, something that just off the rails. Um, Matthew, um, Ford or Chevy? <laughs> Chrysler. <laughs> Mopar. <laughs> <laughs> no, I <I'm laughs> got you, didn't I? <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. No, I, I was. Uh, I, I was trying to be funny. Um, Matthew Miller said something to me. This was years ago. He he may have changed his idea, but he didn't. He wasn't like professing this as uh, something. I I don't. Let me forgive me if I get this wrong, Matthew. I don't think you were talking. You. All right. This was. An, I think this was just this. Just an idea that you had as a maybe, but um, uh-huh. when uh, you said that you were, you were talking about the 144,000 one time, this is like six years ago, five mm-hmm. years ago, and you said, notice how they had not been corrupted by women. And I was like, yeah. Right. Well, how can you not be corrupted by women? I thought about it. I go, well, if you reach, I suppose you'd have to be below the age of accountability. And I think you said that they may be aborted babies. Aborted babies? I never said aborted babies. That wasn't you. Um, then, dang it! I'm sorry. I, well, uh, forgive me. Then. Um. Well. Well, by default, they would find themselves at the altar. Um. I'm sure uh, that would be Rabbi Mike's stance too. It is uh, those that sacrificed, yeah. ladies and gentlemen, um, for the uh, testimony of Jesus. I, I'm sure. Uh, you know, that's one thing I, I don't know, uh, but logic and good sense uh, would tell me uh, that the Lord probably takes them to the altar as well. Uh, but uh, how could you not be corrupted by women? Well, that's pretty easy. Have you ever met somebody with Down syndrome? Yeah. Or yeah. perhaps severe retardation? Yeah. Right? Mm-hmm. Um, so but I'm going to switch it up. Right. And you know what, Rabbi Mike? The most innocent people on the planet. Yes. That's the thing. I mean, it, it's so, like, if you've ever met someone with Down syndrome, uh, you know, re- reasonably severe and that kind of thing, they honestly are innocent. Yes, they have to have that extra help, but they're innocent. They're pleasant. They enjoy life. They enjoy things that the rest of us take for granted. And then you've got the people out there that are like, you know, it's terrible that people like ha- that have to suffer through life. Let's, uh, I think that we should go ahead and kill them off before they have a chance to suffer through life. I'm like, have you met these people? Oh, man. They are man. suffering. Hit, hit. <laughs> they are and you know the, what? The, the right spots in the universe. And, 
And you know what else, Rabbi Mike? There is no guile in them. Nope. No. They're not going to steal from you because they can't even comprehend what you deem to be valuable. Because they don't deem that to have any value at all. If you give to them a $100 bill, they'll probably ask you, what do you want me to do with it? Is this a tissue paper? Mm-hmm. Am I supposed to blow my nose upon it? Though, and man, they're happy. They're ready to go. Uh, yeah. So, if anything, Johnny, um, it's pretty easy to find those that, uh, well, haven't been defiled by women. It would be the young and the um, disabled, then. Perhaps we could assume that safely. We could assume that. We could safely assume that. You would have to find people without guile. Some of them could you be aborted. You have to find people. Some of them could, well, uh, be aborted babies, though, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Sure. David, when he talked about his uh, infant son who died just days after birth, said, he will not come to me, but I will go to him. Okay, and this is the one that God called the man after my own heart. So I've got no qualms with the idea that these aborted babies or souls go straight to the father. But And, and then you get the utilitarian thing where it's like, oh, well, isn't it better that they be aborted than to you? No, it's not, because you've robbed them of all the opportunities they could have had to serve God in this life. Yeah. You've robbed them of all the opportunities they had to make a choice in this life. You have stolen from them something that you cannot give back out of your... Oh, you've done... You've done more than that. You stole it from God. It is God who made them. Yeah. He made them for a purpose. Well, just like goats. He makes goats for a purpose, too. They eat the hedgerows. I'm not lying to you. Ask a farmer. They have their purpose. But, ladies and gentlemen, if you abort a baby, uh, God had created them for a purpose, a rhyme, a reason. And you have deprived him of his own good handiwork. So, all that said, reconsider. yeah, reconsider. Totally reconsider that one. If you already have, though, I mean, you know, there's forgiveness. For anything. But you have to be wanting it. You have to ask for forgiveness. From all That's your right. sins. That's right. That goes without saying. Yeah, I, it does. But I just wanted... I thought maybe somebody out there might be... You know, they are feeling condemned. Because they did it a long time ago. And, you know, there's no reason to feel condemned. I think it's something you need to bring in front of God. And say, look. I really messed up like anything else bad that you've done. Well, you know, if you feel that way, it probably means that you should be a part of one of those ministries that does that thing, help out uh, people that uh, have aborted their babies. Yeah, definitely. What? what? Is, that a, is that a shocker to everybody's system? Guess what God did with, uh, well, who's, well, Rabbi Mike just mentioned uh, David. Okay, figure it out. Please do figure it out. You're not allowed to be perfect. Only one is perfect, and you're not him. So God has put you in this particular situation. You know, maybe you come from prostitution. Guess what? You need to help the prostitutes that are still in prostitution. Did you abort a baby? God has done that for a reason. Because if he didn't do that for a reason... He just would have killed you right where you stood. But he didn't do that. He wanted you, after you had come to his son for salvation, to go out and help those whom you can help. I can't help anybody that's aborted a baby. I'm sorry, but I can't have babies. Okay? It's improper. It is improper for any man to be over any abortion ministry. I'm sorry. They're not qualified. They don't have what it takes. That's something exclusively for women. Exclusively. It's just like uh, a mathematician. If you're a mathematician and you were doing bad things and you come out of it, guess what? Johnny can't go minister to mathematicians. No. 
<laughs> Goes without saying. But who Ross can. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Exactly right. Every single one of us, out of whatever background we came from, God will use that to his glory if we will let him. If we'll just turn to him, if we'll repent and say, look, I give my life to you, what do you want me to do? He will use, uh, uh, let me use the expression from Joel. You know, in the book of Joel, he talks about this army of locusts that would devour everything. But then he turns around and says, but I will restore the years the locusts have eaten. Yes. All of us have years the locusts have eaten because oh, of our sins. Amen. But he will restore that, and he will give them back to you. I mean, no matter what your thing is, okay? Right. I mean, Johnny and I talked with a uh, uh, gentleman whose name is escaping me uh, because I'm John. with names. About John. John, yeah, ab about uh, John you know, Ford. ministering to people who have same-sex attraction, okay, who don't want to be gay in the sense of making that their whole lives, don't want that to be the separation point between them and God, and but have been, you know, they've got that block there that they've been told that that means that they, got, you know, they can't come to God, and he's like, no, you bring him to God first and let the Spirit change them. Hey, he's someone who's been there, he can talk to them in a way that I can't and Johnny can't, okay? God can use that. For so, and, you know, Matthew's exactly right. A woman can reach out to a woman who is, you know, scared and thinking and contemplating an abortion in a way that a guy just can't. We're not there. We don't have the same emotions. We don't have the same responsibility. We don't have the same life-changing decision in front of us. It's not the same, and we can't minister to that. My wife can reach people I can't because she has been in the belly of the beast, because she has been hurt, she's been trodden down, and therefore she can reach the trodden down. I reach intellectuals a lot because I'm a nerd. <laughs> you know, God loves nerds too. It's a matter of God can, will take and use everybody to bring others in for his glory if you let him. The first step is, I know what? I've sinned. Second step is, God, I've sinned. I can't earn my way out of this. I can't repay the debt I owe. Third step is, please let the blood of Yeshua the Messiah, Jesus Christ, cover my sins. Please let me receive your spirit so I can be a new creation, so I can have a complete do-over in my life. That's what the second birth is all about. The whole thing of being born again is the person you were, the person that is holding, held back by all these sins, the person that says, I can't do anything, I've sinned too much, is dead, and a new creation takes its place. Yes, same body, yes, same memories, but you're a new creation. I used to do prison ministry. I have seen what God can do in the lives of convicted rapists, murderers, drug runners, you name it. And because there, I've ministered to people that are in there for life and they turn around and they become ministers to others who are there with them in a way that I couldn't. I could be there and I could train them up, but they having been in that sin, having been sent to that prison, could minister to the people that were there even more than, you know, it didn't matter all the training I had, it didn't matter all the education I had they were there and they knew the forgiveness of God and what Matthew and I are both saying here tonight is if you're hearing this and if our words have convicted you because the Spirit is speaking to you and convicting you, and you're right now going, oh man, God must hate me because I've sinned so much. No, God still loves you. But, you have to repent. But, you have to trust. But, you have to have one God and one God only. You can't have God plus. He has to be your God. He has to be your Lord. He has to be your King. He has to be the one that commands and you go. Look at the life of Saul. Saul said that he was on a Sanhedrin. He voted against those who followed Yeshua. He wanted to put them to death. He tried to trick them into blaspheming in a way that would allow him to put them to death. He held the cloaks of those who stoned Stephen, and look what God did with him. God took that same passion, that same zealousness, that zealot's attitude that was turning him against the followers of Yeshua, and turned him into the most successful missionary of all time. And one of the, the most prolific author 
of the New Testament. Because God could take that same passion that was being used for evil and turn it around to good. And Paul himself would say, I'm the chief of sinners. Oh, yeah. I'm the least of the apostles because of what I've done, but God called me. And he completely dedicated his life to that, and because of that, he was able to take this Oriental, this Middle Eastern religious religion and way of thought and communicate it to the Greeks and to the Romans so that Christianity became, over the course of the next few hundred years, the norm and the natural way of thinking for the Romans and the Greeks. Because, Paul could, because God took that which Paul had, that Paul gave to him, and used it for the glory of God and for the glory of his Son. And he can do the same thing with you if you'll let him. If you will let him. And for those lukewarm Christians out there, if you stay lukewarm, you're vomited out of his mouth. But if you repent, he'll give you a new name. If you repent, he'll make you a pillar in his temple. If you repent, he will give you the Messiah, the white stone, and give you his name. And he will conform you into the image of his son. So you can become like one of these judges that we're eventually going to get around to talking about here. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, taking it, we've taken it so far off the rails. We're going to, yeah, maybe in the um, future shows so it, we'll try to stick... In yeah. these opening the sessions, we get we need to bring take it out into the we need to take it out into practical existence. So it's it's okay that we're going off the rails. I mean, well, I mean it, it's the setup because I mean, look, judges Israel is screwing up and going to other gods over and over and over and over again. Yeah, and yet God uses Israel. Yeah, for you his know, glory. and it's really God is not abandoned Israel, and God has not abandoned you. It's really a type and shadow of all of us. Mm -hmm. Right? I mean, that's why we're, you're bringing it out into everyday life. And, you know, life as a believer. Um, as Paul said, these things were written for our edification. These things were written so that we could see the glory and the mercy of God. Guess what? Amen. American Christianity yes. has become weak and vapid. It doesn't have to stay that way. No. Messianic movement has become el uh, elitist and e e uh, egotistical. It doesn't have to stay that way. Judaism has become, you know, walled itself off from the rest of the world to have, you know, to have less of an impact than it could. It doesn't have to stay that way. God can use all of us. Okay, but, but, are we willing to let him? Are we willing to pay that price? Because there's a price to pay. Okay, he paid the greatest price. It's not that the price we pay earns anything. But if we want to fulfill the purpose he's made for us, we have to be willing to pay that price. We have to be willing to be made fun of. We have to be willing to maybe be prosecuted under the laws. We have to be willing, perhaps, to lay down our lives. We have to be willing to lay down our lives in a living death with people making fun of us and being convinced that we're completely insane and everything else. We have to be willing to be crazy for God. Yeah, we unpopular. If you're, if you're lucky, that will happen to you. It's kind of believe it or not, uh, people don't think that way, but it's actually true. I mean, if you're lu you'd be lucky if you're persecuted for Jesus. I've only been persecuted for my my own shortcomings. That I, you know, looking back on my life, if I ever, yeah, I've been slapped around a few times for the testimony but you know not like I should be I mean uh, we'd be fortunate to be persecuted because definitely you're blessed that's right in the beatitudes there mm -hmm. for righteousness sake let's make sure we're not being persecuted because we're being jerks about it yeah that's huge <laughs> for righteousness right there. sake hey um I, since we're so far off the rails I got Matthew Miller here and there's like this sense of urgency this is totally off topic but I get it's um, becoming this um, huge thing now this year, uh, and that is the flat Earth, um, and uh, it's become such a big thing among uh, 
the circle of people that I'm around that it's starting to really bother me. The only thing that really bothered me was um, there was a, sh you know, one of my favorite shows. They had a guest on and they, they kind of thought he was, they didn't, you know, go along with what he was saying. You know, they thought he was weird, but, um, but it was still very interesting. And one of the things the guy said was that there's nowhere in the Bible where, um, where the Bible, the God refers to the, to the earth as a sphere. And I seem to remember Matthew, this is a question <laughs> definitely directed at Matthew Miller. I seem to remember you telling me, showing me a few places where it paints the world as a, as a ball. Matthew, you're you're serious. Yeah, you're I'm sorry, but it's become such a big deal, and it's there's so many people being attracted to the flat Earth, and that that would be okay for me if they weren't saying that the Bible doesn't say that the Earth is a sphere, and I'd just like you to straighten that out for us. I mean, because there's everybody listening is going to know what I'm talking about. Oh. Okay, I'm 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 absolutely shocked. I, I just want to make sure uh, that I'm getting this from you correctly. These Christians are running around saying that the Earth is a flat plane. Well, more like a dome, that's right. but or not not actually flat, but you know, basically, yeah, flat. So they're saying that it might be like a mountain. Yeah, I guess. Yeah, that's actually more accurate. That is actually more accurate. It's not a. I, I've actually seen some of the uh, things you're talking about, where it, they try to explain some of the movements and, and where the sun goes and everything else by having it. What it, it looks almost like a, uh, uh, like the rim, of, not the rim of the tire, the uh, like a uh, hubcap, where you've yeah. got like a dome in the middle and then a dip and then it reaches up to the outsides. Is, is that what you're? Um, is it, have I? come across the same thing as you were there or yeah and it's gaining a lot of traction out there and now it's gotten a foothold in the fringe community and i just know matthew can show us from it didn't bother me until they tried to say look here's what the bible says it proves us right and i'm like no no so i i know that we're so completely off topic but since this topic is so hot this week i had to get matthew in on it to <laughs> fix it. You just had to get me in on it. Huh? I did. I had to get well, you in for one. You're the only one I know that can fix this. Oh, just me? Uh, well, I'm, I'm sure Rabbi Mike could quickly uh, come to terms for this. Uh, have you ever heard God say this? From the rising of the sun to its setting? I'm sure you have. You need to think about that for a minute. But uh, Let's just talk about um, this... Uh, crazy word of course uh, there in Isaiah chapter 40 uh, because the Lord your God specifically uh, proclaims that uh, he sets above the vault or the circle of the earth uh, that's exactly what he says and he performs this and predicates it uh, with a Hebrew word that means to stretch like a curtain um, like a tent to dwell in uh, he's making himself uh, perfectly clear. Now, uh, this word in Hebrew, uh, uh, everybody needs to look that up. H. Uh, Chug. 23, it's 29? Yeah. Yes. Yep. Yep. 23, yep. 29, <clears throat> it's, it's pronounced Chug. Uh, and I, I'm looking it up along with you here. Um, yeah, going ahead with, with that one. But for those in, who are looking at their Strongs or uh, their uh, uh, Brown Driver and Briggs, it's uh, H. 23, 29. It's just looking it up with you. I did, it's not yes, it is. In there. Let me get out of your way here. No, it's it, it's good that you get in my way. That's uh, per Ladies and gentlemen, just take a look at that word and just chase it around the scripture. Uh, just chase it around, uh, by all means. Uh, but it's uh, that exact form of it uh, is used also in verse 15 uh, in reference to a very particular thing. Uh, so... Ladies and gentlemen, especially from uh, the rising of the sun to its setting, uh, the vault uh, of heaven. Uh, no, that's particularly using in reference to a Hebrew word, 
uh, that definitely means circle or round, a sphere. Uh, that uh, that's why the uh, Hebrew term circle is not used, ladies and gentlemen, because a circle is, of course, linear. It's a two-dimensional object. Right. Okay. Please go to some Hebrew mathematicians and ask them this. No, 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 no. This word is a sphere. That's why it's used for tent. So you know it's not a two-dimensional object. Okay, please, please do this. I'm not trying to insult your intelligence at all, but this is literally an issue of mathematics. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, so a circle, okay, go up to a, 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 you know, just call around to the Hebrew universities, ask them for their mathematician, and they will dis explain this to you dimensionally, because God, using this world, is only speaking dimensionally. He's not talking about a circle. A circle, let me say it one more time, a circle is nothing more uh, than a two-dimensional object. That's why he uses this Hebrew word, which can only and plainly not only not be used for a linear object, as in something that's a flat plane, Johnny, like right. a line. You do know the difference between a line and a segment, ladies and gentlemen, don't you? Okay, that is, literally has no substance, Okay. That's why this particular word was used just a few verses earlier in verse 15. Illicitly so you would know that this is a three-dimensional object. It cannot be a flat plane. It can't be. Can't be. Well, now... That's okay. why the Hebrew well, word there... Yeah, but this guy is saying it's like a dome. He doesn't think it's two-dimensional. He thinks it's three-dimensional, but not a sphere, a ball. There's no reason not to. I mean, let's be blunt about this. The uh, people who wrote the Old Testament didn't uh, actually describe the Earth in ways that could be just be other way. I mean, they were using phenomenal phenomenal ah, phenomenal language. My tongue is getting tied here. Okay, the same way that we say sunrise and sunset, we know that the Earth is spinning. But we say sunrise and sunset because that's what it looks like to us. The Bible does the exact same thing. The ancients at the time, that, uh, by the time of Solomon and Isaiah, okay, knew that the earth was a sphere because they had actually worked out experiments to figure out how to measure where the sun, you know, the shadow of the sun against poles at certain uh, uh, latitudes. So it wasn't a big secret that the earth was a sphere at the time. So just to go back and try to claim that it's, uh, you know, flat or a dome, it's like, okay, why bother? <laughs> I mean, you know, we, and frankly, you can see pictures, unless you want to say that every single picture from space out there is faked, which, you know, why bother, uh, you know, even trying to claim that? I mean, it, it just requires more questions. Gravity is going to compress anything big enough into a sphere. That's just the way it works. It's going to try to compress it into a sphere. So you know, what's the benefit of even tr trying to claim it's flat? I, I don't even get that. I don't either, but it's really taken a foothold, and I just thought that you guys, and I was right, could clear it up. Yeah. Um, well, let me throw in something else. Since we're in Isaiah 40.22, okay, it describes God as he who sits above the circle of the earth. That word circle, hug, is used in uh, Job 22.14 to describe the vault of heaven or the circuit of heaven. So it definitely can imply some three-dimensionality there. And its inhabitants are like grasshoppers who stretches out the heavens like a curtain and spreads them out like a tent to dwell in. Now that phrase, God stretches out the heavens, appears in like 11 different places among nine different authors in Scripture. So when God's repeating it that often, it's important. Guess what? We didn't know what that really meant until the last century, where we discovered that space itself is being stretched out. Now look at this, you know, since we're here, let's look at this whole thing. When you stretch out a tent, the tent starts off in the smallest possible volume. There's no room for anything to get inside of it. It's in the smallest possible volume. And then you stretch it out to give yourself space to dwell in. Hey, guess what? That's what the science is telling us about the universe. It started off compressed in the smallest possible volume, a singularity. And God stretched it out. We 
still don't know the mechanics of what caused it to stretch out. I'm fine with, you know, God did it, or if he used a secondary source, who cares? God stretched out the heavens to make room to dwell in. That's a heck of an insight for somebody writing 2,700 years ago. Why would we throw out such wonderful apologetic value when the Bible correctly explains the cosmology of the universe we dwell in, unlike every other holy book, to sit there and say, oh, the earth is really flat? Come on, people. The Bible is not... It's not a scientific document. But there are too many things like this in here. You know, the Bible says the sun, the moon, the stars that we can see with our naked eye are not the first ones God created, and now we can prove that. Why? Because when it says God made the greater light to rule by day and the lesser night, light to rule by night and the stars also, in Genesis chapter 1, it uses the verb asa, to make, not the verb bara, to create. Asa means making something in the pattern of something else. Bara means to create something completely unique. Moses knew that the sun, the moon, and the stars he could see were not the first sun, moon, and stars God ever created. The rabbis knew that thousands of years ago. Guess what? Now we can prove it, and we're throwing that out for the sake of sitting there taking a, you know, overly literal, uh, not even overly literal, just a misunderstanding of what the Hebrew actually implies, uh, understanding everything the Hebrew can say, for this, to try to say we've got some secret knowledge that they are hiding. Come on. Okay, let me let me. You God know, put the God used the language of people from thousands of years ago. It is not precise. Okay, it uses metaphor. It describes phenomenon. But guess what? You get that away and you look at what it actually says. It describes our universe, unlike every other alleged holy book out there. That is the fingerprint of God on His Word. Let's stop throwing that out. Okay, um, we're gonna uh, we're gonna have to uh, take a little bit more time with this, Matthew. <laughs> all right. Okay. Now, I like to name names. I'm like, you know how people say, "Well, I don't want to name names," but um, Mark Sargent, he's the guy, Mark Sargent, and uh, nice guy, great, nice guy. Um, can't say anything mm-hmm. against his personality. Um, uh, that's the guy. If you want to go see his videos on this, it's uh, and it's really it's just taken off like wildfire. It's uh, youtubecom slash user slash Mark Sargent, and uh, it's Mark with two Ks. It's like Mark K Sargent. So be YouTube youtubecom slash user slash Mark Sargent. Now, Matthew, I've and Matt and Rabbi Mike. Let, let's go over these some his, some of his quote unquote proof texts. First Chronicles 16.30. He has fixed the earth firm, immovable. All right, let's see here. Matthew, what do you think about that? Well, um, let's talk about the many ways why, in ways it can be firm and immovable. Firm is in reference to your ability or inability to stay upright. It's always meant that. Always. So, uh, literally, what he just said was, well, uh, you're going to be fixated upon an orbital path, which we are, by the way, uh, just to make sure everybody is quite clear on this. It is our orbital path that is zero. Your sun is actually off by seven degrees. Look it up. So, that's yeah. just one way I'll answer that question. Just one. Well, that's a good one. Well, I mean, the word for it will not be moved is tamot, which could also mean will not be destroyed or will not be slain. But the real idea behind it is not that the earth isn't moving. It's that you can't change its movement. You that's, can't move yeah. it off its course. Yeah. That's, right. that, that's, that's, that's that what I... It's absolutely fixed in space. Yeah. I mean, it doesn't, that does, argument doesn't that's even what make I sense said. if you even... And exactly. It doesn't make sense if you spend three seconds looking up the, the Hebrew word. I mean, Strong's would tell you this. I mean, Strong's right, is incomplete, right. but that's, it would tell you this. <laughs> that's that's why I said what I said. It is fixed upon the orbital path. Yeah. Psalm 93.1 now has fixed the earth, immovable and firm. Basically the same one. Psalm 93.1. I'm going to guess it's the same word, but let's find out. 
Oh, this one I actually have. Let's see here. Yeah, it's the same exact. It's the same exact verb. It's it, lest it shake or lest it slip, lest it be moved out of its course. It doesn't mean that it's not moving. It's saying that you can't shift its movement. Ah, uh, Psalm ninety six ten. And, 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 and are talking about. It's basically <laughs> saying to men, "Hey, God's the one who established this. Mortal men, you can't change this." Okay. <laughs> You know, if God wants to move it, hey, it talks about God, you know, making the earth, t you know, teeter like a drunken man, okay? And, and, you know, it's in the day of the Lord, God can sh do what he wants to to the earth or the or it, earth orbit or its axis or whatever. It's Both these are addressing mortal men and saying, hey, God has established this. You can't move it. It will not, you can't change it in its course. It has nothing to do with the earth being it. You know, a fixed point. Oh, in the man. <laughs> can, can I say this? Yeah, please. I mean, anything else you can add to this, Matthew, that, please. The, the, the more that Rabbi Mike speaks, the more he gets me going. You know what? Let's just go to the Bible that uh, is actually quoted in the New As a matter of fact, uh, Christ quoted from the Septuagint. Let's think about that for a minute. Uh, but let me give all these conspiracy theorists something to really think about. The Septuagint, the word used there, is gyros. You know a gyroscope? <laughs> Ooh, good so one. It means 10,000 more times than a sphere. It most particularly means a sphere in circular motion, which cannot be moved. That's literally, um, that's literally what it means in the Greek. Which makes so perfect I, sense, because I've by been, the time the Septuagint was written, they knew the Earth was a spinning sphere. <laughs> I mean, this is not new That's science. That's right! <laughs> yes, they knew. Um, so, just, I mean, please look it up. I'm not lying to you. Look it up. You're going to get there. Hey, there's no Strong's words for that. But, well, I, I hate to run on your party. I don't need your Strong's. Don't need it. I'm sitting here looking at it in what I marked up when I was a child. And it's it's actually right here, and the yellow is so old it kind of looks green now. But that's what it is. I'm sitting there looking at it. I know what that is. That's gyros. It's what the word comes from for gyroscope. Look it up. Now, Rabbi Mike made a mention <laughs> the other day. Isaiah 40, 22, folks, in case you think he was talking about right, Psalm 93. Right. He's talking about Isaiah 40, 22, just for clarification. Sorry. Jump back in there. Right. <laughs> and, and I say this for that reason, that should I elect to go there in the Greek, what Rabbi Mike just talked about, I'm just going to have to wind up saying the same thing. Because it says it any which way you can. It says the same thing. So, um, very interesting uh, question there. Can I ask you this question? Uh, if this is so popular, tell me, what is its purpose? I've been wondering that myself, but the best I oh, can... I well, the best I can gather is that the Earth being a sphere is yet another... No, no, no. Is a yet another con uh, is another uh, conspiracy against mankind by the elite to keep us f for in a cage well, to keep us from like I said. <laughs> so Terry Pratchett was right. <laughs> well, <laughs> let no. me say this now, now. Let me correct you, okay? Because Christ actually spoke Koine Greek. Um, he didn't call the Earth a sphere. He called it a gyro. I'm, I'm just reminding you of that. Which is mathematically, it is mechanically, oh for Pete's sakes, let's do the new age way. It's philosophically more complicated than a circle. Okay? But um, it just begs the question, what is this distraction for? I mean, I'll, I am all for it. I'm sure Rabbi Mike would be too. Um, if there was a rhyme or reason to run around saying that the earth was flat, um, if this was uh, detrimental to people's decision-making process, then I'd be all for it. And, and I am not of want uh, to, uh, you know, 
not find pleasure in discussing any biblical topic. It's just, I would curious to know the root of this. I mean, this is certainly not any matter of deception. Okay? I don't care if you believe the earth's flat or round. Um, here's what's important, and me and Rabbi have been talking about this probably, I, I think, the whole episode. You need to stop sinning. You need to quit rebelling against the law and the will of the Lord your God. That's important. Okay? Whether or not the earth is flat or round, which is a pathetic question, like I said, it's a gyro. That's what God said. He called it a gyro. More than once, actually. Please look it up. Yeah, you've given so, me all I hoped for. I knew you could fix this. Well, no, no, no. What's now, the, time uh, out. I, mean, I haven't fixed it. Rabbi Mike fixed it. I mean, he plainly uh, uh, told to you uh, the answer in Hebrew, which Mike didn't fix it. I'm sorry. God's word fixed it. It's well, just that yeah. we just pointed out what it said. That's all. That's what I mean. That's all we. Well, here, here's the thing. Here's the thing. I, I have to question. Okay. Okay. Let's suppose that the earth was flat and that the elites were somehow hiding it. Why bother? Okay. That's the whole thing is predicated. It, I'm going to, you know, Chris White and I have talked before, and he and I do not see eye to eye on everything, okay? He's deeply suspicious of the Messianic movement for a good reason. He's actually been in it, so I give him some credit for actually knowing what he's talking about there. But uh, he and I have talked about this, and he is spot on when he points out that it is very easy when you start trying to dig into trying to unravel the actual lies that are being told to us to start getting a puffed up head, start getting proud about secret knowledge that you have. Okay. And understand, that pride of, oh, I know something everyone else doesn't, is the foothold that the adversary uses to get into your life. It is his foot in the door for you to sit there and start going, oh, I know something everyone else doesn't. I'm special. I see and everyone else is blind. No. No. We need to be humble. We need to understand God made a universe that makes sense. He states over and over again that just as the laws of the universe are fixed, just as the sun rises every day and sets every night, as the laws of the universe are fixed, so is his steadfast dedication to his covenant with his people fixed. It's Jeremiah 21 and 23. Okay. So if you start playing games with, oh, let's start pretending that the laws of physics aren't fixed and that somehow a massive thousands of miles across dome or flat sphere or, or you know, whatever can somehow not be compressed by gravity into a sphere, that somehow that's not fixed, guess what? You're calling God a liar. You're saying that God, the one who created the moral laws of the universe, couldn't create physical laws of the universe that make any sense. And you can go, oh, I know the truth. Everyone else is de deceived. Come on. There'd be no way to hide that. Heck, Astronomy was my first love before I got into the Word of God. <laughs> you know the Earth is a sphere if you get into astronomy for five minutes. I know. Okay? Just, it's the shape of gravity. Everything is the shape yeah. of gravity. It's you have to have God suspending the laws of physics in a bizarre way just for the Earth to make this work. God doesn't work that way. God made laws for the universe and fixed them in place to show his justice. That's why the scriptures say that the heavens declare the justice, the righteousness of the Lord. Not just his power, but his righteousness. Because it demonstrates that he can create a single set of laws for all time in the physical universe, and therefore his moral laws are equally steadfast. And when you start playing games around and claiming that, oh yes, there's all these exceptions and everything else, guess what? You call God a liar? and you say that he is not steadfast, that he did not create a single set of laws for the universe, that he suspended them to make the earth a disk in the middle of it. Why would he? It's a good point. It's a really good point. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. I know. And this, I know you guys. This is the sort of things that when Christians 
fringe or otherwise adopt these sorts of ideas, it makes us look stupid and it blasphemes the name of God for no good reason. Yeah. You know, I wouldn't have a problem with any of this except for two things. When questioned, the guy really came forth as a believer. I mean, believed in Jesus. And they wanted to know, you know, you know, what if he was a believer uh, and hey, he time said out. that when time out time out i don't care what he said i really don't i'm gonna base that judgment off the words of the son of the living god i don't care what he said right. tell me what are his fruits what does he do yeah see i mean i don't know i don't know i just the, i wouldn't mess with this whole thing except for the guy is a believer so being right there he's there's an issue there with me number two he's trying lord, to prove lord okay you know the guy can say he's a believer and maybe he is but he's spreading deception in the name of messiah right, i was explaining why i even brought this in front of matthew and yeah. you no 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 well, well, no, I agree with you. I, I'm well, glad you brought it up. I mean, we're not mad at you. I was, <laughs> I, look, I was upset because he was trying to use the word of God to prove his point, and I knew that couldn't be done. Right. No, no, that that that's actually physically and mentally impossible to do. A God uh, and His word will never prove your point. It will only edify, erect, and establish His will, not yours his point and that it does exclusively 100 percent of the time so if you're trying to use god's word to prove your point guess what you lost already you That's lost right so uh and i know johnny mentioned this one if you torture the data long enough it will confess to anything <laughs> But that's not what we're here to do. We're not here to torture God's word into saying right. something that we want to say. We are here and, to and sit at the feet of the word of the living God and learn from him and to absorb his wisdom and then to go forth with what he's commanded us to do. Not just an intellectual exercise. Mm -hmm. It is getting his instruction to go forth. Amen. Amen. Amen to all the above, and, and I know Johnny did a knuckle-headed thing and mentioned this guy's name, and I don't know this guy. I'm not sure the ins and outs, and neither does Rabbi Mike, and we're not trying to attack this dude. I'm just saying no. that, uh, you know, um, ladies and gentlemen, I never speak about any mystery, and that's a fact. Every single thing I have ever said, I can take you right to God's Word and show you exactly what it says. And that's what me and Rabbi Mike really do. We sit here and talk about the original language, but, I mean, there's no secrets there. It's just that Rabbi Mike knows more about Hebrew uh, than Tom, Dick, and Harry. So he's not talking about any mystery. Anything that Rabbi Mike just said, go look it up, I dare you. No, I beg you. I literally beg you to go look it up. Look, look at it. And then you'll un start understanding why it don't have vowels. Why God wrote Zephaniah chapter three, you'll 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 understand these things. So, just please try to remember that, ladies and gentlemen. If you're using God's word to prove your point, you're already coming up short because it'll never do Matthew that. And I, yeah, and Matthew and I don't want you guys out there and you ladies out there to follow us. Okay, you know I hold the title of rabbi. Okay, but I'm not the rabbi. I'm not raising disciples for myself. Matthew's not raising disciples for himself. We're trying to encourage everyone to be disciples of the rabbi, Yeshua, the Messiah, Jesus Christ, Jesus of Nazareth, who was the one who came, and he's the one who came to make God's word clear, and you'll notice that he didn't complicate it very much. He made it clear. He died for your sins. His blood is covering your sins, if you will put your faith in him. He rose from the dead, demonstrating that God accepted the sacrifice. He sits at the right hand of power forever and ever, and he's coming back. He is your rabbi. He is the one that we want you to turn towards. When we give you these things in Scripture... You know, when we're talking about stuff in the Hebrew, we're talking about these little hints, you know what we're trying to do? We're trying to inspire you to go, really? That's in there? I want to look it up. We don't want you to take our words for it. We want you to look it up. We want you to say, 
I want to be able to see that. Because we want you to read the Word of the Living God for yourself. We don't want disciples for ourselves. We want disciples for the King of the universe. That's what we're trying to inspire you towards. And not simply to sit there and get into an intellectual exercise where it's like, okay, I study this. Oh, look, I've discovered all these secrets and now I'm enlightened. No. You go do what it says. And guess what? What God wants you to do is very simple. Yeshua summed it up in two commandments. Love God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your might, and love your neighbor as yourself. Everything else is commentary. Go and study, but everything else is commentary. And yes, God has given us prophecy. Yes, God has given us words for specific times and places, and we are in one of those times. We are in a time of prophecy when his hand is evident for those who will see it. But what he wants of you is very simple. He wants you to be his representative. And insofar as you learn God's word and you study it deeper and you study the Hebrew and, everything, and the Greek and everything else and you absorb that, it is for the purpose of understanding his purpose for you. Some God is gifted with a greater intellectual gift. Some God is gifted with a greater immersive gift. God has given me a great intellectual gift. My wife is the one who can reach the hurting people far better than I can. And we work with each other well. Why? Because we are two members of the same body. God has given everyone who has put their faith in the King of Israel, his spirit and the gifts of his spirit, to go do what he wants you to do. He will equip you fully if you will let him and if you will do what he's calling you to. And don't be jealous of another man's gifts. But at the same time, don't be lazy about it. You're capable of far more understanding of God's word than most people are even trying to achieve. These are the words of the living God. This is his conversation with you. You want to have a conversation with God, people are like, I want to hear God's voice. You know what? Read the Bible in prayer. Or Your listen. prayers to God, his word to you, and it's a conversation. Or listen. I mean, I if you can't read, a lot of people have problems reading. I know I do. Got ADD real bad. They're so... They're it's tools. so It's so easy to listen to the Bible these days. I mean, there's for yeah. free. There's no <laughs> excuse. I know dailyaudiobible.com, you can get through the whole Bible in one year, 15 minutes a day. You haven't got 15 minutes a day to get through the Word of God in a year. I've been, I'm on my fifth yes, time through. Yes, one quarter of your favorite TV show, come on. <laughs> yeah, I'm on my fifth time through. I got 15 minutes a day. I don't care who you are, you got 15 minutes, I don't care. Um, Matthew Miller, I'm on a 6% grade. Uh, steep Hill, I just lost my brakes. I'm going to tell you what, that corner is about 30 seconds away. I'm not going to make it. Mm -hmm. Leave me to the Lord. No. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> Lead you to the Lord. <laughs> Here we go, ladies and gentlemen. Fast and the furious. Jesus loves you. Let me explain to you who he is. He is the barrier between you and the wrath of the Lord thy God. It's very, very, very simple. And the only thing you have to do is cry out to him before you hit the, that corner at the bottom of the hill. Cry out to his name. Cry out to the Son of the Lord, your God. Cry out in Jesus' name, Jesus, save me. And guess what? Lickety split, he shows up. Because you're only ever going to cry out his name because God has drawn you to do so. Please read the book of John. That's what it expressly says so think about that if something is nudging you right now it is God drawing you to his son and all you have to do is cry out and he hears you it's very easy as a matter of fact I'll just pray it for you just try to remember what I say or write it down dear Heavenly Father I have been caught wanting in my sin. I'm in a heap of trouble and a world of hurt. I am broken, incomplete, and corrupted. My life is such a mess I have proven to everyone in my life that I cannot lead my life. Please lead me to righteousness. Please forgive my sins and make me whole 
even though my blood is polluted, substitute that blood for the blood that your son shed for me. Forgive my sins and give me the strength and the courage to do what is right. Please, Lord Jesus, please be not only the Savior, but the leader of my life. Help me get up tomorrow. Help me go to bed tomorrow night. Help me live my life free from this treachery. I thank you, Father, for being faithful. In the name of your Son and my Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, I pray. Amen. 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 All right. All right. I want to thank uh, Bruce Collins. The Iron Show is on the Fringe Radio Network at the behest of Bruce Collins. I want to thank uh, producer Rick uh, for having patience with me and helping me to connect to the fleet of Shoutcast and Icecast servers broadcasting live all over the world from the city of London and England. FringeRadioNetwork.com. Listen on your telephone. Listen on your smartphone. Download the app from the Google Play Store. Fringe Radio Network. Do a search. All right. I want to thank uh, Peter Goodgame and Dr. Future for early inspiration. I want to thank uh, Matthew Miller and Rabbi Mike for staying up late with me tonight as we uh, continue our journey through the book of Judges, my dream come true. All right, hey, um, if you uh, said that prayer with Matthew Miller, would you please uh, send me an email, ironshowstudio at gmail.com, ironshowstudio at gmail.com. That's ironshowstudio at gmail.com. And while you're at it, send a, send an email to Rabbi Mike. That's Michael Bug with two Gs at gmail.com. And I believe uh, it's the... <laughs> what is it? What's your email address, Matthew? Prophetico at mail.com. All right. Prophetico at mail.com. That's prophetico at mail.com. Till next time, good night, everybody. Johnny loves you.